Dr. Strauss, would you briefly describe your educational and professional background? Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Biola University and going into college I was interested in both science and Christian theology. So Biola was a place where I could study both. Um, my major was something called physical science, which was kind of a mixture of physics and chemistry and math. After graduating from Biola, I uh, applied to a number of universities in physics, ended up going to UCLA to do graduate work. And so I got my PhD from UCLA in uh, experimental elementary particle physics. And it's also known as high energy physics because we collide particles at very high energies to probe the structure of matter. Um, after UCLA, I did a postdoc work with the University of Massachusetts, and I worked at Stanford while doing that. There's only about uh, four or five labs in the world where you can do high energy experimental particle physics. One of those is at Stanford. So even though I was employed by the University of Massachusetts, I spent one day there in seven years, and then uh, the rest at Stanford. And then uh, finally I got the job I have now, which is as a professor of uh, particle physics at the University of Oklahoma. How did you develop an interest in the study of physics and cosmology? Probably my initial interest in science um, is because I'm a product of the 60s and I watched the U.S.-Russian space race and watching people go to the moon piqued my interest in, or perked my interest in science, maybe piqued it as well. Um, so I was always interested in science. Going to UCLA, I really realized that the fundamental questions about the universe um, were things that most intrigued me. And I think those fundamental questions are what's the universe made of at its most fundamental level and where did the universe come from? And I really focused on the former, uh, studying the fundamental particles of matter. But what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years as we've understood, as we understand more and more about the origin of the universe, the two fields that study the smallest elements of matter um, and the field that studies the largest parts of the universe, the cosmos itself, have, have come together. Because what we learn in our particle accelerators about the fundamental particles of matter is really probing back into time when shortly after the Big Bang those were the only elements there. So what's really happened in the last 10 years, these two fields of particle physics and cosmology have almost meshed into a single field when we look at the very early universe and the very smallest elements of matter. And so I think in the last 15 years in particular, as my particular field of study has overlapped more and more with cosmology, my interest in the origin of the universe has radically increased. What have been the prevailing scientific theories of the origin of the universe? Well, before the 1930s, um, most scientists believed that the universe was eternal, and it was called the steady state model. And even when the evidence for um, a beginning of the universe started to, to develop, both the theoretical evidence in the early 1900s and then the experimental evidence starting in 1929, even then many scientists held on to the steady state model. In fact, as late as 1959 or so, you would still find that although the evidence for an origin of the universe was quite um, prevalent at that time, most scientists still felt that the universe was eternal. Um, and that was the prevalent scientific model until really the last 40 years, maybe. How did the shift from a steady state model of the universe to the Big Bang model take place? I think what happened is scientists are looking for the best model that fits the evidence. And the evidence for uh, the Big Bang and the origin of the universe just became so prevalent that it overwhelmed the philosophical bias that scientists had towards an eternal or steady state model. And the evidence primarily comes in three forms. Um, first is the fact that the universe is expanding, like, like an explosion, although that's really a bad terminology. Um, if the universe is expanding, you could run the film backwards and it would come to a point when it actually had a beginning. Uh, the second evidence for the beginning of the universe is what we call the cosmic background radiation. And that's the leftover heat from the Big Bang. Much like turning an oven on and letting the heat dissipate throughout the house, the Big Bang was a very hot explosion or, or origin of the universe. And that heat is still around in the cosmic background radiation. And then finally, the Big Bang predicts how much primordial hydrogen and helium 
should be in the universe. And basically we see exactly what is expected. In fact, now we see what's expected to about one part in 10,000. And so the evidence for the Big Bang became so overwhelming that um, scientists um, chose to give up other models in favor of this one, even though it was philosophically unappealing to some scientists. Could you discuss some of the submodels of the Big Bang? There's always been submodels, and there always will be more submodels because uh, we don't know what happened at the beginning. Um, the primary model that seems to have risen head and shoulders above everything is what's called the inflationary model of the universe. And it says that shortly after the Big Bang, um, space itself actually expanded at a rate faster than the speed of light. Nothing can travel within space faster than the speed of light, but space itself can actually expand faster than the speed of light. And the inflationary model seems to be backed up by the evidence um, that we see and make predictions about what we see. So it seems to have, in the last few years, particularly with some of the new measurements of the cosmic background radiation, the inflationary model seems to have really risen above the other ones. But um, the inflationary model also says that when inflation started at 10 to the minus 43 seconds, we lost all information about what happened before inflation. So there will always be questions and maybe n no experimental evidence about what happened in the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So there will always be room for lots of variations on the origin of the Big Bang. What are some of the problems with the oscillating model of the Big Bang? Well, for a while after the steady state model went into disfavor because of the evidence, scientists developed what was called an oscillating model, that the universe would expand and contract and expand and contract forever. The problems with that um, eventually became overwhelming as well. Um, and I could list many of them, but the major thing that I see now is that in the last three or four years, the measurement of the cosmic background radiation has become so precise um, that it seems to rule out any oscillation. The other thing is we've now seen what we think is, um, well, we don't know what it is. We call it dark energy, but we don't know what it is. And what it seems to be doing is actually causing the universe to expand at a faster rate. Well, if this continues, then the universe can never collapse again if it continues to expand at a faster rate. So all of the observational evidence seems consistent in that the universe um, has never collapsed and will never collapse. So I think most scientists don't think that oscillations are going to occur. Certainly the experimental evidence show no oscillations. But nature is surprising. So many hold out hope that the, the um, dark energy will somehow reverse the sign and instead of causing things to move out faster, might somehow cause it to contract. But uh, the evidence that's available to us now basically rules out an oscillating universe. Would you comment on Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time? Um, Brief History of Time is a, is a great book. Um, it's been said by many people that it was probably bought by more people and not read by more people than any other book printed. Um, but the preface to that book, as well as the book itself, had a motivation to try to rule out the need for an originator to the universe. And so I believe that Stephen Hawking had a prejudice in writing the book. And the goal was to show that even though the Big Bang is the correct model of the universe, in those first 10 to the minus 43 seconds, what happened rules out the need for a creator. And I think that he didn't show that. First of all, I don't think he showed that it is true that you can rule out the need for a creator. But beyond that, it's where a lot of scientists have gone when we talk about origins. They've gone to just speculation. Um, if the evidence from the universe points to a real origin, which opens up the door for a real creator, many scientists find that philosophically unappealing. And so many of their ideas are really speculation as to how we can weasel out of the need for a creator. And I, in my opinion, that's really what um, A Brief History of Time is. It's some um, brilliant speculation on what the universe might be like in order to try to get out, get away from the need for a creator. 
What is your take on the anthropic principle? Well, the anthropic principle is a terminology that was developed um, in the late 70s and early 80s primarily. And it's the idea that the universe seems to be finely designed or finely tuned for life to exist, particularly human life. And that um, the universe, if it was made in any other way, would not be able to support life. Um, scientists that are naturalists, materialists, don't like to talk about the anthropic principle because it makes them uncomfortable. Um, but the facts, I think, are unambiguous. The universe clearly is um, finely tuned in such a way that it allows life to exist. The source of that tuning can be debated, but I think the fact, and whether or not it's truly an anthropic principle, whether it's really designed for man or some accident of nature or one of an infinite number of universes is what is debated by materialists. But uh, I think it's certainly clear that this universe is one of the very, very rare universes that could support life. What lines of evidence are there for an intelligent design of the universe? There's a lot of evidence that the universe is designed, and the anthropic principle is really an attempt to try to explain that evidence, whether or not you attribute it to a designer or not. You read a lot of stuff in the literature in the, um, that scientists write outside of their uh, scientific papers, but when they write books for the general public, and they talk a lot about the appearance of design. And the idea is that um, the universe just looks too um, designed um, from our perspective. And again, your philosophical bias will determine whether you think that design is real or whether it just appears to be design. But everything from the amount of matter in the universe, which we can talk about in the, you know, a little bit later, because I know you have some questions on that, um, to uh, the subatomic world, it, it screams that there is a designer. One of the um, classic books on the anthropic principle was called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle by um, two authors, uh, Barrow and Tipler. And in this book, they list over 100 things in the universe that appear to be specifically fine-tuned so that life could exist. Uh, their ultimate conclusion is that humans are the only life form in the universe, and we somehow create the universe for ourselves. But they come to this bizarre conclusion because the evidence for design is so overwhelming and because they don't believe there's a God, they must come to some conclusion that some intelligence is the designer. And so I think that whether you are a theist or a materialist, um, a naturalist, uh, the evidence for design is so overwhelming that nobody who looks at this comes away saying it doesn't look designed. They either say it's designed and we're the designer, it's designed and God's the designer, or it only appears designed, but it's a freak accident of nature. Could you give other examples of the fine-tuning in the universe? In the cosmos, let's talk about that first. Um, the amount of matter in the universe is finely tuned. It's, as the universe expands, uh, the matter in the universe is attracted to all the other matter by gravity. So if there's too much matter in the universe, as the universe expands, the attraction causes the universe to slow down and eventually collapse. And if you have too much matter, it collapses before there's time for the universe to develop to the place where it can support life. If you have too little matter, the expansion happens so fast that you can't get galaxies and stars and other life form, uh, things that are essential for life to exist. And shortly after the Big Bang, at about 10 to the minus 34 seconds, the amount of matter in the universe was finely tuned to one part in 10 to the 60th. And so that's not a number you can play with. If you tweak this amount by one part in 10 to the 60th, you get not just a universe that is inhospitable to life as we know it, but a universe that is truly inhospitable to any life. Um, recent studies of this, um, expand this accelerating expansion of the universe have started to measure um, not just the amount of matter in the universe, but the total amount of matter and energy. And we now see that that is fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 60th. This is a recent development in the last few years. And so in both these cases, we're talking about tuning that is necessary to have any universe at all that is capable of supporting life. And you find this in 
everywhere you look, from how carbon is formed in dying stars to the strength of the strong nuclear force, you find this fine-tuning exists so that uh, some form of life can exist. How finely tuned must the subatomic world be? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, in fact, you know, the, the revolution of the early 20th century was the revolution of quantum mechanics, that the world at the subatomic level is unlike anything we know at the macroscopic level. And the subatomic world is finely tuned. Quantum mechanics itself, if, it, if there wasn't such a thing as this bizarre world of quantum mechanics, there would be no molecules, no chemistry, um, you know, no life at all. I already mentioned that the strong nuclear force, what holds the protons together in the nucleus and what holds the quarks together in the neutrons and protons, is tuned to about five, 3 to 5 percent. And if you change that at all, um, then you don't have the elements of the periodic table that allow life to exist. One of my favorites is about seven years ago, we discovered a new elementary particle called the top quark. This is the heaviest elementary particle we know of. One single particle weighs as much as a whole gold nucleus. And, and this particle is interesting because the subatomic world is so strange that inside protons you have what are called virtual particles. Particles that pop into existence for a brief second and then pop out of existence. It's almost as if I threw you a baseball and halfway um, along the path the baseball turned into two bowling balls. And the bowling balls started coming to you and then they came together and formed a baseball again. Well this happens all the time inside the proton. From out of nothing you get these two top quarks that appear for a second and disappear. The top quark is a bizarre particle because it's so heavy. But if you changed its mass just a fraction of a percent, you would change the mass of the proton itself. If you change the mass of the proton, you change the ratio of, the pr of where electrons are as they orbit the nucleus. If you change that, you destroy life. So things as esoteric as virtual top quarks inside the proton and their mass contribute to this fine-tuning of the universe. How do those who do not believe in a designer explain the fine-tuning of the cosmos? There, there are a couple very interesting theories that have been develop, developed. Um, the inflationary universe allows an infinite number of universes to come into being. So one of the explanations is that our universe is just one of an infinite number and we happen to be the lucky one. Of course, as an experimental physicist, the problem with that is those infinite universes are never observable. So it takes a huge leap of blind faith to believe that there are an infinite number of universes. Another one is that um, a um, permutation of the oscillating universe is this possibility, since we don't understand the dark energy, that somewhere, not even in the dis near future, but in the distant future, meaning you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of years from now, the universe could oscillate. And maybe it's been doing that for a long time, so that again, there are an infinite number of universes. Another theory is that um, black holes themselves can spawn new universes. But all these theories boil down to a belief that we are a special universe out of an infinite number of universes and we just happen to live in the right one because everybody admits that the fine-tuning is there. Um, the problem with all these as scientific theories is that those other infinite universes are never observable and so since science is based on what we can observe and test, these to me are well outside the realm of science. What are the strengths of a purely materialistic worldview? I imagine there are. I don't think of too many off the top of my head. I, I will say that um, material, materialistic worldview works extremely well almost all of the time. And it is our, our view that the world is deterministic and materialistic that allows us to do science. If every time I went to the lab, a miracle occurred, I couldn't do science because I could never get a reproducible result. So the materialistic world allows us to do science, to study the world, to see that what we um, observe is what we expect to observe. I tell my students in physics class that the goal of physics is to predict the future, to understand the physical world so well that given any situation you can predict what will happen. 
The problem is that the materialistic, a purely naturalistic worldview, a purely materialistic worldview, neglects even the possibility that there is something beyond this universe. The amazing thing is that new theories about the universe are becoming more and more bizarre. The idea that there are not just three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, but there are at least ten dimensions, is becoming more and more prevalent in the scientific community. In fact, in our accelerators now, we're looking for what we call extra dimensions that, that are outside this four, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So the scientists themselves are becoming more and con more convinced that there's more than what meets the eye. And um, to me, that is just another step to say we really are spiritual beings. There is more about humans than meets the eye. And the problem with the naturalistic worldview is it negates that possibility even before it's been investigated. What are some of the weaknesses of a purely materialistic worldview? The weakness of it is that um, if there is more than materialism, if that's even a possibility, by starting with the philosophical bias that materialism is all there is, then you can never find the truth about reality. And to me, that's what science is. It's an investigation of the physical world in an attempt to understand what's true. And if you a priori say that there's a whole realm of possible truth, that there's something outside the material, that I'm not even going to um, say that it might exist, then you um, close the door to what reality may, may actually be. Can a materialistic worldview distort scientific inquiry? Th that's a good question. It depends on your definition of science. There are some scientists who say that science is materialism. Material science equals materialism. Then, of course, the materialistic view cannot distort science because the two are equated with each other. Um, if your definition of science is that science is um, observing the natural world in, a, in order to understand truth, then of course it can distort science. Because it is possible that the truth we learn in the natural world may actually point to something beyond the natural world. Um, there's a famous mathematical theory called Goodell's theorem, which was developed in the 1930s, I believe. And it basically says that any confined, now there's lots of ways of stating Goodell's theory. One way of stating is any confined system um, is insufficient to just even describe itself. And so that theorem, if it's true, says there is something outside of the universe itself. There's outside even something outside of the human brain, which could be classified as a computer. And um, there are indications all over that there is more than just the naturalistic world. And I think to close the door to those possibilities before you've even investigated them is a real pitfall to, that you want to avoid. Well, I was also thinking in terms of, of starting from a, a position that in the naturalistic world you might have to invent things like Einstein's cosmological constants or anything. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that, you know, if I start with the presupposition that the naturalism all, is all there is, within my science, within my study of the natural world, it's not going to be too much of a downfall. Be in fact, most scientists are naturalists, and it's not a downfall. The problem is, I think, um, it closes the, the door to two things. One is that possibly origins, the origin of this material, comes from a non-material source. And uh, the Big Bang says that the universe has an origin. Where did it come from? And to say everything's natural, you close the door to that. The other is, if there is a supernatural, then occasionally, although not often, but occasionally that supernatural being can step into the world. And there will then be occasional things, I don't think they're too often, where there is no natural explanation. And uh, you close the door to that opportunity to observe those things in a purely naturalistic worldview. Well, the cosmological, all right, so that's a good point. Let's get back to the cosmological constant. Einstein's um, equations of general relativity showed that the universe seemed to be expanding. His equations said that the universe was expanding and decelerating. And that was an unappealing um, 
that was unappealing philosophically to Einstein because that implied the universe had a beginning. And this was back in the early 1900s when the steady state model was the common theory of the universe. So Einstein invented a, invented a cosmological constant, a fudge factor so that his equations would allow the universe to be infinite. Um, when the experimental evidence began to come in that the universe was expanding and possibly did have a beginning, Einstein later said the cosmological constant was one of the biggest mistakes of his scientific career. But again, I, I don't want to criticize science. The, the neat thing about science is it is self-correcting within the materialistic world. I mean, Einstein eventually, even though the cosmological constant was poor science at the time, he, he threw it out because the evidence showed otherwise. Now we think we may need a cosmological constant. It's back in vogue, although it's quite, quite a bit smaller than Einstein's. It could never do what Einstein wanted it to do. But um, I, would, I would disagree with some who say that a naturalistic philosophy hurts science. I think when it comes to certain subjects, like origins, for instance, what is the origin of the universe? What is the origin of life? Um, in those instances, um, a purely naturalistic wor worldview could l miss the truth, and in that sense it could dis distort the science. But I think it's a very rare occasion, uh, occurrence, and I don't want to um, dwell on it too much. How did the Christian worldview play a role in the rise of modern science? Of course, many of the early scientists of the 16th, 17th century were devout Christians. And um, before the Christian worldview became prevalent in science, you look at the science of, um, um, the, look, look at the gods of the ancient Greeks and Romans who were somewhat like us and had all the flaws that humans have. And the world was not necessarily comprehensible by observation. But the early scientists, uh, Newton and Pascal and um, even Galileo, felt that they were observing God's universe, that God was a God of order, and he would create a universe that reflected that. And so much of the early scientific developments were predicated on the fact that by studying nature, you could study um, what God was like. And in fact, Newton wrote that, that when he looks at the stars, I'm not, I don't remember the exact quote, but when he looks at the stars, the moon, the sun, the planets, he sees not just the God, not just um, the God who created them, but the God who is actually Lord over the whole universe. In his book, God and the Astronomers, Robert Jastrow, a self-proclaimed agnostic, wrote, For the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Would you comment on Jastrow's thoughts? Yeah, I love that quote by Jastrow because it really is insightful. I mean, what he so eloquently states there, um, that quote was written as the evidence for the Big Bang became more and more compelling. And what Jastrow so eloquently states is that the beginning of the universe, regardless of when that was, is strong evidence that what theologians have said for centuries um, is true. The Bible itself starts out with, in the beginning, that this universe had a beginning. Maybe one of the only places in history where um, science and religion truly have conflicted is in this question of the universe, where science for so long held that it was an infinitely infinite universe and time, and the Bible so clearly states that the universe had a beginning. And although many people think science and religion conflict in many areas, there are f very, very, very few that they ever have or ever will conflict in. And this was one of them. What's the origin of the universe? And what Jastrow writes is those religious people were right, that scientists have had to um, accede the fact that the universe had a beginning. And that is what the theologians have said all along. And it's just another case where um, the truth of Christianity and the truth of the natural world ultimately agree because they reveal the truth from the same person. Paul Davies has moved from promoting atheism to conceding that 
The laws of physics seem themselves to be the product of exceedingly ingenious design. He further testifies, There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. Would you comment on Davy's conclusions? Uh, Paul Davies is great to read because he's one of the few uh, scientists who think about this and state the obvious um, without any qualms about that. And I love what he writes. He's not afraid to say um, that the appearance of design is overwhelming. He's not afraid to say that it seems like something's going on behind it all. Um, the sad thing for me is that, to my knowledge, Paul Davies has never acknowledged the fact that what's behind it all could be a personal God. And that, to me, is what's so profound about the Christian message, is that there is something behind it all, that what Davies sees and Fred Hoyle sees and Robert Jastrow sees is really true, that the universe is so designed and so complex and it had its or origin, but yet that what is behind it all is this personal God who cares about humanity. In fact, in another quote by Davies, he says that the impression of modern physics strongly suggests to him that humanity has a purpose. Um, it's, again, not the exact quote, but uh, I love Davies because he is so candid in his writing. Would you comment on this quote from Alan Sandage? We can't understand the universe in any clear way without the supernatural. Yeah, there would be naturalists who disagree with that statement, but I endorse it wholeheartedly. Um, not only does the supernatural answer the questions about where did the design come from, where did the information in the universe come from, a new theory about the universe is that it's primarily not about elementary particles and fields, but it's um, about information. And this theory goes under the name the holographic theory of the universe. It's, it's quite interesting um, that somehow what we see is almost like a hologram of an informational theory that's underneath it all. Um, and the bottom line is that um, there is something going on. And the great thing about um, Christianity is it says that this something going on is a personal God. It's not just... Um, impersonal force, it's not just design, it's not just information, it's not just a creator, but that that creator who filled the universe with information and designed it, um, again, cares about humanity as a personal God. And so I think the great thing is that not only the materialistic universe and the laws of nature and what we study about nature itself makes more sense, but all the big questions about humanity and purpose make sense when we realize there's a supernatural. Albert Einstein wrote, The scientist is possessed by the sense of universal causation. His religious feeling takes the form of a rapturous amazement at the harmony of natural law, which reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. Would you comment on Einstein's thoughts? Yeah, that's a great quote. It, it is amazing to me that the universe can be described by natural law. I mean, more and more, the scientists look at a, an equation and they say, this equation is so beautiful, it must be true. There's a, there's a theory that's been around for at least a decade now, probably longer, called string theory. And it's a, the theory of what the universe is made, at its mo, uh, made of at its most fundamental level. There's no experimental evidence that string theory is true, but the theoretical physicists love it because it's beautifully complex mathematics that describes the universe so well. Um, Historically, when a physicist has come up with a new mathematical equation that describes what we know about the universe as being true, but extends what we know, they'll often say this must be true because the math is so beautiful. And lo and behold, it usually is. Um, it's happened over and over again. Dirac, um, Paul Dirac, developed an equation that 
implied that there was these things called antiparticles, even though no one had ever seen them. But the equation was so beautiful that he said, they must exist, and lo and behold, they did. Where else do you see that? You see that in the design of a painting or a building. You see that in design. When, when the underlying mathematics structure, the equations, describe something so beautifully, you can't help but say, there is someone who put a lot of thought into this. And again, supernaturalism lets you attribute that to someone who can think, who can put design in. Naturalism leaves you wondering, why does the beautiful mathematics describe the universe? Sir Fred Hoyle wrote, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics, as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Would you comment on Hoyle's perspective? Yeah, I like that quote because it starts out with a common sense interpretation of the facts. I mean, what this has done is it's taken, for many of us who believe that there's a God, it has um, said science now supports that. You don't have to go off on a limb to look at what science now says about the universe and say there's a God. All you have to do is take a common sense interpretation of the facts. You know, you will never be able to prove God through scientific inquiry. But to come to the point where scientific inquiry has led us to the fact that a common sense interpretation of the facts themselves indicates that there seems to be someone who's monkeyed with the physics and biology is a pretty strong statement that um, God exists. His creation, even to someone like Fred Hoyle who denies God's existence, his creation is so clear that a common sense interpretation of the facts says it looks like the numbers are without question, there's something going on behind it all. Where did the idea originate that Christianity and science are in conflict? I don't know the answer to that. A lot of times I get the answer, well, that was Galileo, because there was a big fight between the church and Galileo over the heliocentric or geocentric universe. The problem was that really wasn't between a religious idea and a naturalistic idea. It was between two naturalistic ideas. Is the sun the center of the solar system or is the earth? The problem was that the church misinterpreted some passages in scripture and held on to those misinterpretations. But when you look at the truth of what Christianity says um, and the truth of what the Bible says and the truth of what the natural world says, there is no conflict. Um, the only place where you come into conflict is not between science and religion, but between naturalism and religion. If naturalism is all there is, then there cannot be a supernatural origin. And although I strongly believe that the facts of nature now point to certainly an origin of the universe that could very likely be supernatural, um, the conflict comes in just those very few places in the history of the universe where you have to have a beginning, like the beginning of the universe, possibly the beginning of life. But in reality, there is no conflict, and historically, you can look high and low. And the one place where there was a conflict, I've already said it, was whether the universe is, was eternal or had a beginning. And now there's not even a conflict there. Everybody agrees the universe had a beginning. I think the thing we need to emphasize is that that conflict between Galileo and the church was not really a conflict between religion and science. Whether you look at it as a conflict between a Greek philosopher's idea and a modern Christian scientist idea, or whether you look at it as a conflict between two naturalistic ideas, or whether you even look at it as a misunderstanding of the Bible, it's not really, even that one case that everybody brings up, is not really a case of religion and science conflicting. How many universes would be required to make our finely tuned universe plausible merely by chance? I think I read a number that was 
10 and 1 to the 60th. 1 in 10 to the 60th, right now. Well, let me try that again. 1 in 10 to the 160th. So, you know, more or less an infinite number. This universe is so rare that uh, what's the difference between 1 in 10 to the 160th or an infinite from our finite minds? It's not that much different. I mean, it really is an infinite dis difference, but those numbers are so huge we can't even comprehend them. The bottom line is um, we have one observable universe, and the only way to allow man to exist in this one observable universe is to either postulate a god or postulate a near infinite number of non-observable universes. Does the multi-universe theory tell us more about objective reality or subjective belief? Does it tell us more about a person's mind or heart? Yeah, I think the multi-universe theory does uh, talk about a, a philosophical bias. The philosophical bias is that um, the materialistic world is all there is. And in many cases that is a great presupposition because normally in science um, the materialistic world, world works. The laws of nature are constant and I can study those. And uh, I've heard it said that uh, that's because there is a lawgiver who set up those laws of nature that therefore are followed by, by nature. But I think when you speculate beyond an observable universe, when you speculate about infinite universes, it really is a, a religious bias. It's a bias that um, I do not want to uh, even let the possibility exist that there is a supernatural. And therefore, even though there will probably never be any experimental, ev experimental evidence for an infinite number of universes, my philosophical bias, my heart, will lean to that um, interpretation. Um, I, there was a, there's a physics professor, at astronomy professor at the University of Oklahoma, and he teaches introductory astronomy occasionally. And um, he, put, he, he sent me an email and he said, why don't you go down to your mailbox? I want you to look at the last lecture I give to my introductory astronomy class. So I went down there and I got the lecture. And it basically outlines the evidence for the design of the universe. It shows how clearly the universe is designed. And at the end of his lecture, he says, this leaves two possibilities. Either there's a creator or there's an infinite number of universes. And uh, I knew what his bias was. So I, I knew what his heart was. So I went and talked to him. And I said, um, why do you choose the latter? as the explanation, and his only response to me was, why do you choose the former? Now, I took that as a rhetorical question because I could explain to him for two hours why I choose the former, why I believe there's a creator. But I really believe that you've hit the, the key point, the key nail on the head. The evidence for design, the evidence for origin is so prevalent that we have two possibilities. One possibility is that God created it. And one possibility is that there are an infinite number of universes. And there are two things that separate those. First of all, they're both philosophically biased. But the second one is that, this is so amazing, the infinite universe theory can never be tested experimentally. But the God-creator theory can be tested experimentally. Because God supposedly is a being that exists that we can interact with and get to know who's left evidence, historical evidence, personal evidence about who he is. So which is a better theory as a good scientist? An infinite universe theory that can never be tested in my materialistic world, or a personal God creator theory that can be tested with other historical evidence, other personal evidence, and who is a being that I can actually get to know and therefore be 100% certain that it's true. As a scientist, this theory seems a lot more appealing because I can go test it where this theory, all I have is my philosophical bias that naturalism is all there is.
Would you care to comment on this profound quote? We can't understand the multi-universe theory in any clear way without the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> yeah, you know, the great thing about the infinite number of universes is that it allows the Cubs to be successful somewhere. And uh, so, you know. But the, the real thing about it, though, is that in all those infinite universes, the Sooners are still ranked number one. 